Do you ever just feel like you're in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so there's a town, 10 or 12 k's ahead, according to GPS. Having GPS is pretty handy, because this stuff is pretty full on. Hey, Billy boy, he's a bastard today. Hey, bastard. Warning. This film contains frequent strong language, hunting and meat preparation, adult themes, alcohol and drug use, scenes of cultural traditions viewers may find upsetting, and reckless behaviour. Enjoy. Who Louisa and I are, it's not really important. Um, how we came to meet, it's unique, I'll give you that. And we had no idea at the time that it would become what we think is probably one of the greatest love stories ever told. We, um, we never really even intended to long ride or long ride together. But when two people that want to believe there's still magic in the world come together, magic happens. Magic finds them. And, well, this is the story of how two strangers a dreamer and a drunk became the Jilly Dog Gang. I'm in the shit. The missus is off me, being hit by a car this morning, and I had to have four shots of vodka with the Russians. <laughs> and uh, anything else? <laughs> well, I have to find the tools to fix me fucking bike. What happened um, to your bike? Well, I broke it last night when I was driving pissed. <laughs> now, running into interesting characters is nothing new for me. But when I met Lou, I just couldn't believe it. She'd just ridden around Mongolia with her little dog and a couple of horses she'd bought for a few months. She was staying in a, a hostel in Ulaanbaatar when I met her and I told her I was going to ride west. She had no plans other than heading back to Germany. I said, look, I've got some gear. Um, we had a couple of vodkas, a few beers, and um, we decided we'd hitchhike and start in Kazakhstan. And that brings us to Gunther. Gunther is, well, he's a character. He left Aachen in Germany and drove east just to see how far his little car would go before it broke down. I can't make this up. I'm absolutely serious. So we met Penelope, the little Toyota Corolla, and Gunther near the White Lake in the middle of Mongolia. Now, me and Lou spent 17 days with him, and we hitchhiked through all kinds of adventures, dramas, and unforeseen circumstances. Everything from fixing the, uh, the gearbox sump which had fallen out with a, a bit of wood we hammered in to driving literally straight across the step. We just, I, I where do I begin? Every, every time something happened, did someone would wander out of the step and, you know, just have some vodka with us. And it, we just had this, this adventure that I can only describe as being exactly like Top Gear. Like a Top Gear, it, it, great journey. It, it was incredible. We, we rode on the roof of the car most of the time, drinking beer sitting up there. We, we crossed four-wheel drive tracks and endless step, just laughing, smiling, enjoying life together. As the saying goes, not all those that wander are lost, and Gunther wasn't lost. Gunther was on a search for new experiences, and he found them. And when he saw, you know, some goats, he, he asked if we could buy one. So we did. He knew I was a, a former professional hunter, and after spending the day in the car with us, the, um, the goat, well, well, it ended up on the fire. It was something that was so normal for me, but for a vegan chef from Bavaria and a German guy as a school teacher from Aachen, it was a new experience. And every day we had new experiences together. But it was more than just the experiences. It was taking time to enjoy the little magic moments, from a kiss with some chocolate and some vodka sitting on a, the roof of a car overlooking a lake, to just laughing. It was incredible. And, and Penelope, this little car that just wouldn't die, just shared so many laughs with us all. It gave us a home. It gave us a place where Lou and I became basically untouchable. We were best mates before we even considered riding off onto the step together. Hey, Louisa. Hmm? You gonna ride off into the sunset with me? Ah, uh, yes, with a bee in my hand. Fucking hell, yeah. I really wish we had uh, Jeremy Clarkson narrating this uh, doco, because right now he would be calling us a couple of absolute bellends. 
got this buckskin stallion, we got a couple of little geldings, and quite honestly we had no idea what we were doing. We just made it up as we went. We lost a horse, we made up something new. We cut our gear, we sent heaps back with Gunther, and we switched to riding a single horse each. Honestly, there's, there's some sort of magic that comes with just not knowing what you're doing. Everything's new, everything's exciting. And Louisa in particular just viewed the world with this incredible childlike wonder. These relationships we had with our horses, they were... I, I just I don't even know how to describe it. We relied on each other in this incredibly beautiful place. And we formed these really solid routines. Uh, the rising and the setting of the sun the search for kebabs and beer, uh, it, was, it was magical. Everything was magical. We just enjoyed every Snickers bar, every two minute noodles, every fish can, every apple juice and vodka. And we laughed, we laughed so much. We laughed so much that little by little, Lou and I began to fall in love. And well, I don't know what else to say. This was the happiest time of both of our lives. Yeah, I know. At some point, you know, docos just sort of end up, you know, getting a bit, how do I put it, a bit lame. People go down that spiritual road and all of that kind of stuff. But the truth is, we were, we were just having fun, totally wild and free, living in, in the moment and, and nothing else. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's best I just, I just share those unedited, raw, crazy moments. What are you no. laughing about, Louisa? <laughs> Me last night. <laughs> what, what happened last night, Louisa? Well, well, we didn't get any water. We couldn't get any water, so we got apple juice. And then <laughs> Pete came up with this great idea of what kind of apple juice. So since lunchtime, I think... Yeah, we basically drank one cup of apple juice and I couldn't handle it as good as I thought I did. So what do we have for dinner? <laughs> well, it was fish can with barley and pasta and a lot of a lot of hot sauce and a packet of um, soup seasoning and it would have been probably pretty disgusting but I was so drunk and so hungry that I went really into it and didn't even have chili in me. Um, so we, um, we made the pasta and the barley with, um, with apple juice um, and for lunch again because we were sure of water we had apple juice and beetroot soup um, that was good. That was a good soup. That was a good soup. Apple juice was a pretty strong theme <laughs> to yesterday. Um, now, when you got a kiss goodnight, what was it you said to me? <laughs> we smell like cat You see why I love riding with this girl? Well, I'm not quite sure how to describe life on the step. Uh, it's a feeling more than anything. It's this, it's this connection to this, this world that, that everyone else has forgotten. It's, um, this is how we're meant to live. A man and a woman with horses and dogs and no care in the world, just living in the moment, pure moments. Like, uh, there's only a few hundred Pybolskis horse in, in all of Kazakhstan, and yet there they were, right in front of us. Now, I don't want to get all spiritual in that, but a meal that you've caught or traded with, uh, with the locals when you're, you're freezing cold and hungry, it, it has so much more value than just getting a feed of McDonald's. And we got a few rabbits, but no deer or anything like that. And, in a lot of the lakes and creeks, we'd, um, we'd often spear the, the wider moor or the carp, and that when we were really lucky, we'd get the little graylings. And as lonely as the step felt, it wasn't. Everywhere we went, we, we met people. There were always people willing to share these, these magic moments with us in this incredible place, and families that, that, that just welcomed us in. And I've never met happier people. I mean, this guy is the vet from Botacara. He came out and checked on our horses, and. This is another horse breeder and 
These guys are the horse breeders and they just welcomed us in. Not only did they welcome us in, they shared in our journey. And whenever we were heading in a direction that you know people knew we were going, there'd be cars waiting for us to welcome us in and take us to the next house, to, to the next hot meal, to the next hot shower, to the next beautiful family willing to share love with us. And, and that's why we carried our flag. We carried the Australian flag and everywhere we stayed we got people to sign. And they felt a part of our journey and, and we felt a part of their families. And that's horse meat on the table and man you get used to it, it is beautiful. But look at this, this is, this is love. And say what you want about Islam, but we found the religion of peace. We found truly beautiful people beautiful food, beautiful culture, and there's people in the West that are depressed with a Mercedes in the driveway, parked next to an Audi, watching a big screen TV, but these people who so often have so little have found a way to have something the West doesn't. They're happy. And so when we left Kazakhstan, we felt we should leave our horses there, and we left them with good people. And I don't never want to leave I watch you sleep And I listen to you breathe oh. And I don't never want to leave I watch you sleep I watch you sleep oh. Well, there's a million hits on YouTube. Oh my God. Oh, thanks. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, I'm speechless. So I can't help but notice there's no ambulance here. <laughs> there's no medics here. <laughs> There's probably 200 stallions, um, all monstrous sports horses. Um, safety precautions include three guys wearing Russian tank helmets. That's, that's it. <laughs> um, Osh would just shut this down in a heartbeat. This, I've never seen anything like this. This is, this is the coolest thing I think I've ever seen. Um, I, I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. If I see a beer tent, that's it. I'm, I'm done. I'm moving to Uzbekistan. Well, there wasn't a beer tent, but I'll tell you what, there were uh, a lot of people uh, selling and drinking vodka, and believe me, I got amongst it. So, <laughs> before I explain Kupkari, I just want you to put your Western mindset aside for a moment, and just um, respect the fact that they think a gelded little pony paddock with, uh, you know, the little horse doing its arena stuff, and blankets and rugged and matchy-matchy tack, they think that's cruel. These guys, they have stallions. At times they'll have as many as 2,000 stallions here, and they manage their horses so incredibly well, it's not funny. But amongst a melee, they need to use a whip to communicate with their horse, and many things about this people consider cruel. It's not cruel, it's part of their culture. It's a culture developed through war, sat thousands of years of war, and, and they train using a, a, a 70 kilo dead sheep. Uh, rather than a, a wounded comrade, because that's what this is for. This is training to pick a wounded comrade off the battlefield. So they grab the, the dead sheep up, they gallop, hanging on by I don't know what. I mean, you can see here the guy's like got one foot over the sheep and he's barely in the saddle. And the horsemanship is beyond anything you'll see anywhere else in the world. It is, it is mind-blowing, the connection these men share with their stallions. All eight to nine year old stallions. Not two year olds like the thoroughbred industry. No, these horses are mature stallions that have had wonderful lives and go on to have wonderful lives after their, their game playing years. It's absolutely spectacular. And these guys were so reluctant to share this world with us because they're so afraid of the West trying to change them. So we got in there and uh, we had a crack at it as well. Um, 
it's heavier than you think. I could barely pick it up. Um, and I managed to get to the canter uh, before I, I dropped it. Louisa, on the other hand, did a lot better than me. And if we trained every day for the rest of our lives, we wouldn't be as good as the worst person on this field. Louisa is somewhere in this. <laughs> Louisa is somewhere in there. Postar Valois! Postar Valois! What have we just done? <laughs> we committed to take a crazy horse. <laughs> How crazy is it? Pretty crazy. He just um, throwed our, the rider off who showed us to ride his own horse. It hasn't been written for a year and yeah, it's pretty young still for, so it probably hasn't been written before a lot. He turns us back if you can't do it for him, but he's, he's good. He's really good. He's good. Actually, Lou, no. No, he wasn't good. He was too young and he'd been abused and it took three people to hold him down before I could ride him into a snowstorm through a city. It was um, an egotistical decision. It was an egotistical decision made because we wanted to keep the ride going and that was our best option. We were restrained by our finances, our time, our visas, lots of things. We pushed on through the freezing cold and we did all right. We did form good bonds with these horses, but Beersheba was young, crazy, and you know, he needed another couple of years. And Bluey, bless him, wonderful horse. He, he worked hard. He was a mild-mannered, calm, Kupkari horse, and he was the rock that all Beersheba's drama broke against. But he was, um, he was carrying injuries. He, um, he had a few strains in his, his front legs there, and, you know, we just, we had the wrong horses. We'd learned a lot, and we were being advised incredibly well by the Uzbeks and, and so many people, but the advice I got before we set off, it was, it was terrible. Everyone that thought they knew about long riding didn't know. And they really kind of set us up to fail. My ego didn't help either. And looking back, I see things like the white patches on this horse's uh, withers there. That's from incorrect saddle fit. And we rested them as much as we could and we slowed things down and we kept adjusting things. But at the end of the day, we'd, we'd chosen the wrong horses. And we realized in Uzbekistan that there was so much that we could do better. And as much as we love what we're doing, I mean, Jill got chewed up by some dogs and we just, didn't have enough magic moments like this with people handing us kids for photos and you know it was just it was hard work so we um we did the best thing we sold the horses we crossed the Caspian Sea we committed piracy of course and we started again in Azerbaijan Well, the truth is Azerbaijan was different. We couldn't find suitable horses at a suitable price. So we got some donkeys. We got a donkey cart. Donkeys are stubborn. It didn't work for us. It was a mistake. We're real honest about our mistakes. The one mistake we didn't make was um, going to Georgia. That was awesome. Amazing people, amazing, amazing country. And it was just what we needed to get our hearts and minds back on track. You know, I mean, Going to donkeys is like going to a diesel-powered scooter after owning a Ferrari. Um, it just, it just didn't work. It just didn't work for us at all. Uh, so being in uh, this wonderful place called Javivi, just above the capital of Tbilisi, where the horses just roam free, uh, we had an opportunity to start some young horses. So I took on this little Velociraptor. Uh, she is a moody little mare called Pippa, and then we've got the beautiful Kashlama, who was just, it was just the sweetest little pony ever. So we, we were offered a, a place to stay in exchange for starting and working with the young horses. Um, and again, I say starting. I mean, these are young horses, little three-year-olds. So we're not trashing them. We're not putting them into full work. We're just getting them started under saddle because these guys do do a trekking business there. But um, it was just great to be back on horses. And, and, and Lou and I really felt like we were going in a good direction again. We, um, we rode with um, amazing Georgian horsemen. 
We had the, the Dugori Battlefield, which was this amazing monument just up the back of the property that we could um, that we could ride to. And Georgia is, it's an incredible place. I mean, there's so much history there. There's thousands of varieties of wine. Everyone in every single village brews their own wine. And look, the people, they're funny. Don't get me wrong, they have their eccentricities, but they really are good people. And as, as sort of it became apparent that, you know, there was this coronavirus thing and we all sort of started worrying about what would happen next, Lou and I looked at our options and we didn't want to quit. This is how we want to see the world. We want to see the world between the horses' ears and we had no choice but to hold out here. So what's the haps, Lou? Well, I'm gonna go through. <laughs> I hate being in front of camera and doing it again, please. Well, Louisa, how can we show people all our building and stuff? <laughs> and like the magic of the post-montage world in which viewers now find themselves in. If... Right. Well, we're having a beer. We've been watching a movie in our beautiful room, which Pete is gonna show you now. <laughs> He built it out of old doors and windows and a bit of material from town, but mostly recycled. And look at it, it's beautiful. So with the lockdown in full effect, I built a bar. I mean, everyone needs a bar, but when the snow came, it brought something else with it. It wasn't all fun and games and, you know, happiness. Wolves came, big wolves, lots of them. Dogs did their best to fight them, um, but we got hit hard. We got hit really hard, and we started losing foals. Um, it was tough. It was freezing, and uh, every day I was at war with the wolves, and we did our best. Okay, so um, this foal's fine. It's got a little neck, it doesn't need a stitch or anything like that, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> this hole is not okay. <clears throat> As the snow receded, the valley came back to life and uh, Lou brought on a, a new project, a beautiful little rising four-year-old stallion. He was a real handful, real spirited, just the most green horse ever. He'd only ever run wild and Lou bonded with him very quickly. Her first ride was rather spectacular because we didn't have yards or anything like that. But as soon as he calmed down, these two, they just, they had some sort of magic. They really did. And everywhere Lou went, Alami went with her. Oh, and of course, Jilly. So as spring came on proper, restrictions eased, and we started partying with the neighbors. They were good buggers. We had many a drink, many a uh, recreational substance, um, and we had some really good times. I mean, there were still sort of lockdowns and restrictions, but people, people just wanted to get their lives back to normal. So we partied and we moved around Georgia a little bit. We spent some time um, in um, Signagi with an incredible winemaker and, and his team there. We, we rode some amazing new horses and we went and explored the mountains of Tushedi. Now Tushedi is something else entirely. It is, it's spectacular. It's incredible. It is so unforgiving. Now you lit I'm on the edge of a thousand meter cliff here and it is 1000 meters to the bottom of that. And if you fall off, you're straight off. And there's Lou just galloping, drinking. Uh, that's Kesey, beautiful Georgian wine, beautiful Georgian meats. Um, just, it's a special place. Another place that really has that magic, just like you know, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. The people we met here were incredible, and I saw horses do things that, well, there's no other way to put it. I, I didn't know a horse was capable of this. More importantly, I didn't know a horse was capable of these things ethically. And it was in Georgia that I really grew as, as an, I would say, an empathetic horseman. I still pushed the limits, but I was doing a lot of research, and I was understanding so much more, and the closeness we shared to nature there, it was, it was really special. Georgia really was where Lou and I came of age as horsemen, so to speak. But the big thing was, we had a chance to live when others couldn't. Okay, so there is, yeah, yeah, there is yeah. no music playing. Fuck you. 
Louisa <laughs> is dancing to the tunes in her own head. It's amazing. <laughs> Yes, Louisa, what did happen to the music? You still dancing to it? Hey, Lulu, you know how I make videos of stuff? Fuck off. Turn off. Heat. 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 This is the fucking best thing that's ever happened. Well, we just got the message. We, we, there, was, there was nothing. Someone writing a message, okay, the horse is dead. And how did you feel? I really, I really expect him to stand there when I come. I just, even so I know he's not. I just thought all the moments I had with him, but. First night in Turkey. Second night, but first Second night, night out. Let's have a little car here. It's terrifying. <laughs> when I started, I just had this idea that it'd be me and one or two horses the whole way to Europe. Well, COVID, every other boundary, you know, the visas, financial aspect, all of that meant that was impossible. So finding horses, or good horses, often meant uh, compromise. So for us that meant leaving uh, Georgia and heading to Cappadocia in central Turkey. Uh, we went to a place called Akalteki Stables and they'd uh, been in touch with us before and they were able to show us a really wide range of horses. Now Cappadocia is a special place um, for a lot of reasons. Underground cities, uh, incredible scenery, the, it's just the amazing horses and, and it's it's also somewhere where they do a lot of this balloon flying stuff. Now I'd never really seen balloons before. Um, I've seen a, a silver metallic disc like UFO basically fly straight over the top of Louisa and that wasn't anywhere near as amazing as these balloons. So with uh, a couple of Arabian horses picked out and paid for, uh, Lou and I had an incredible day riding with the Turkish horsemen throughout Cappadocia. Balloons above us and uh, another bunch of a dozen plus Arabian horses around us. We had just I, don't, I uh, Arabian horses that they're, they're, they're not like normal horses. They're sensitive. They're powerful. They're they're so expressive. I mean, if you hold them back, they just go sideways or, or up. They're um they're unbelievable. And Louisa and I knew with. Uh, you know, a whole lot of country ahead of us. We were in for a real special time in Turkey. But straight away, we started uh, getting attacked by dogs. Uh, we had random encounters, traffic. It, it was tough and we were crossing a high desert. It was um, absolutely freezing cold uh, and we crossed 300 kilometers of salt flats. Um, it, it was a very, very different experience, but the people were amazing and we enjoyed every second. Okay, so maybe not every second, uh, between the dog attacks and the stallion attacks, uh, there were also donkeys. <laughs> this donkey that I named Duffy, um, Duffy followed us for the entire day until we managed to spot a donkey cart. He got interested in the donkeys and we galloped off. I remember as a kid talking to Great War veterans and they said that uh, the Turks would throw them oranges and water bottles and things at Gallipoli. Well, we found the Turks to be this, the same kind of people that those uh, those diggers talked about. They were just so welcoming. Um, everyone had a cool little horse they wanted to show us and have a ride on with them. And there was always a stable for us and we never had any problem getting hay. Uh, we were riding in, in sort of the you know, November, December and it, it was cold. But the hospitality, the warmth of the Turks, it was, it was unbelievable. We drank a lot of this stuff called Raki. Lou didn't like it, I loved it and the horses were always fed so well. That old Sandy ripping into it there. But the, the terrain was challenging. Um, we, we, we had free pass basically because it was COVID and tourism, they, they wanted to bring it back. So tourists could go anywhere, but the whole country was locked down. So we could basically do whatever we wanted 
and we took some really challenging and some really interesting trails as we headed towards the Dardanelles. Uh, and we were hoping to cross either into Greece or Bulgaria. But we, we were carrying hay with us a lot and we, we really we went, we went to a lot of effort to keep these Arabians fed. Now, as great as an Arab is, they, they do need more food than the steppe horses. And here's Lou. This is the side of a motorway. Um, there's no cars. We just walked up the motorway because there was no one there. And then we bumped into this guy. Uh, he hasn't shot the bow in three months and he's just, the muscle memory is unbelievable. This guy is a master horseback archer and swordsman. And he's got a bunch of Syrian refugees that he's uh, teaching to ride horses there. And he's just a superb cultural ambassador for Turkey. See, this is a refugee. He's been, he's been teaching up how to ride horses and things. But the true testament of how amazing the Turks were was moments like this. It's New Year's Day, Lou had walked her shoe off, uh, nothing was open, everything was locked down, and when some people saw Lou just sort of limping through town, they threw three pairs of shoes out the window. I'm not joking, the Turks were amazing, and when we got stuck at the border, some Turkish gypsies secured our horses for the night and gave us a feed and a bed. A lot of people ask us, what's the hardest part about horseback travel? Well. It's saying goodbye to a horse you've fallen deeply in love with. And Lou and I had completely and utterly fallen in love with our, our Turkish Arabians, Sandy and Midnight. But they couldn't cross the border because their paperwork was a mess and they had multiple vet chips stuck in their neck. So we went over to Bulgaria. We stayed with this amazing lady, Liza, and uh, her work away, Nikki, from the UK. Uh, Liza's an, another German, but uh, she works as a translator and has this cool little pony trekking business. So we stayed there and uh, we helped work the horses and we fixed up all our gear and made heaps of new stuff and we really started to get it together. We needed new horses of course and sadly we knew they'd be ones we couldn't afford. Family helped us out though and we were soon, you know, enjoying Bulgaria, enjoying the nature, enjoying just every pure moment with our new horses. I rode a Cabradin cross Arabian called Marengo and Lou, a beautiful pure Turkish Arabian called Smokey. Bulgaria, it was, again, it was, an, it was a whole new country. The second you cross the border, it's, it's different to Turkey. There were wild horses everywhere, and, and because we'd waited so long to get the new horses, it was spring by the time we really got moving towards Germany. We had these incredible bonds developing with these new horses. Smart, sensitive, reliable, powerful, and finally, we packed them right. So we covered a reasonable amount of distance reasonably quickly, just enjoying every minute. The boys, they were besties. They were just in love with each other. Uh, both geldings, both six years old. For the first time, we really had appropriate horses. And again, we met amazing horsemen every step of the road. These guys taught us so much. They mentored us, they showed us new things. And Lou and I were really reaching a point where like we felt good about what we were doing. Like we were good. Like we played Kupkari and and you know ridden gated horses and mountain horses and Arabians and and everything in between. And we really started to feel like part of something special. And spent an hour in customs because I'd overstayed by 47 days. But those dudes were just freaking awesome, amazing. We had some laughs. Show them how to hypnotize a horse and Romania, baby! Right, first international border crossing with a horse, no dramas. Marengo, you know what that means? Empires. I'm about to have real Italian pasta cooked by an Italian and it smells amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's got basil leaves in it and everything. Oh my God, I'm so excited. This is living right here. This is living. <laughs> Lou and I basically had no money. Now, we had a bit and we paid our way and we certainly didn't expect anything for free. So we'd help out a lot and uh, stay with people like this for a bit. Uh, we did her firewood, we helped tidy up for her. Um, she gave us food and accommodation for a couple of days. 
And it's amazing how many great people love being part of the story. And with, you know, summer in full swing, Lou and I were just, yeah, it, this, this was, I mean, it's not the gypsy life. I don't know what you'd call it. It's not homeless. It's, it's not, you know, traveling in style. It's, it's not camping. It's, it's just this pure experience. Everything is so visceral, so real. Like, I mean, a, a, a coffee machine randomly on the side of the road to, to fruit from the trees, to the smell of the flowers, to the, the pain of the insects biting only to make a little mesh net and then be safe from them. Everything just has this, this purity and everyone wanted to share in it. I mean, Romanian TV found us a bunch of times. Um, uh, sort of once when we'd walked through a city and we shouldn't have and nearly got arrested. But yeah, like every moment, every moment was pure. Every, look, I mean, this is a perfect example. Every stumble where you, you don't end up in the river. Every moment where the horse does something good, you have these, these chances to bond and, and just, we were, in every sense of the word, a family. And this is where we first, you know, sort of coined the term, the, the Jilly Dog Gang. It was us against the world, moving at the dog's pace, as a team, as a family. So we got the thunder and lightning. Oh, Jilly. Middle of the forest. Ah, Jilly. The worst cattle dog ever. Terrified of everything and terrible with horses. But we love her. And as we crossed the Carpathians, she was just that extra little bit of sunshine that followed us everywhere we went. The Carpathians, unbelievable. We were, we were on our way to Dracula's castle, obviously, because Romania. And having crossed the Carpathians, we didn't even bother going in. Nothing that man could make could stand even in the shadow of the beauty we, we sort of saw and experienced there daily. Uh, it was amazing. And the Romanian people, like every other people we'd come across, they were just beautiful. We went from one party we were invited into to another party we were invited into. Everywhere we just met these people that wanted to share their lives, the beauty they saw in the world, in everything with us. And of course we were more than happy to have a few beers, dodge some bears and laugh, smile and be a part of their story, just like they were a part of our story. And say what you will about Romania, there's no vampires there. It's just beautiful people. And it's somewhere that, for me, again, we took a step. Lou, now full on, no longer vegan chef, she was hunting, cooking, and doing things I never thought she'd do. We, we were becoming more. And I started to get afraid. I started to get afraid that soon this would all be over and we'd be going back to reality. Crossing onto the great southern plains of Hungary, the boys were tired and we needed a rest. Fortunately, we met the white witch of the southern plains, our buddy Nora. And Nora, who lives as wild and free as us, but from, you know, her base on the plains, gave us somewhere where we could hang out with Lou's sister, Laurie, who'd come over from Germany, and just recover. Recover in an environment that was familiar, yet unfamiliar. It was magic, and the girls, well, they made the most of the rest, they made the most of the laughs, and we really got strong before we headed off again. It was, um, it was really special, having that time with someone that understood us, and again, just more amazing Hungarian horsemen, just, just everywhere. We just felt part of this, this great European steppe horse community that was just appearing before our eyes. You know, wonderful people welcome us, welcome, blah, talking is hard welcomed us in, fed us, cared for us, and just took the time to teach us things and share with us. And as crazy as it sounds, these people have become lifelong friends. Like, the closest people in our lives are some of the Hungarian steppe people that took care of us. We were changing, you know? We were changing because our environment had changed so much, and we started to share what we'd learnt. 
We started doing a few magazine articles and things on all the aspects of horse welfare we'd learnt from, from our mistakes, mistakes we made firsthand that we were determined never to repeat again. I seriously can't make this up, guys. Austria is exactly like Austria on the television. Where the Wiener Schnitzel and the Believe it or not, almost all the audio I've recorded has been one take in bed with a, uh, like a blanket over my head because I just want it to be real. I don't want it scripted. And what happened here, none of this was scripted. None of this magic was scripted. Meeting these people, none of this was scripted. None of this was planned. I mean, I'm wearing Captain Miller's helmet from Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> this guy, Frisian exclusive, is just... <laughs> I always dreamed of riding a Frisian stallion. Hey, it's it's the impossible dream. We come round a the corner. There's a Frisian stables. And the next thing I know, I'm riding this rhinoceros. I'm so scared I'm going to do something wrong. <laughs> it's just, it was. <sighs> Taking a journey like this is about letting go. And I'm going to try not to get emotional because <sighs> we've been through so much. And then Lou's mum joins us and rides with us. And everywhere we go, every day, there's magic and there's beauty. Because we'd let go of everything. We have no house, we have no money, we have no jobs. We're just living in the moment. Every day, every day, I saw something beautiful. You know, having random dudes on tractors, drinking beers, driving past, deer in the fields. You know, every moment I shared with this, this horse that just completed me. I mean, every little thing we did just brought joy and laughter to those around us and, and to us. And it was coming to an end. And, um, sorry. I, you know, I, like, I knew I'd be emotional trying to, like, narrate this, but... Yeah, um... Uh, how do you... How do you ever repeat this? Like... Everything, everything about this journey was beautiful. And we were now crossing Austria and getting close to the German border. Uh, we'd been on the road for well over 750 days. And our horses were part of us. We covered about 3,600 kilometers on this pair of horses. And I didn't ride him anymore. I just thought with him. I, I can't explain it, but when you live together like this it's like freaking avatar or something you know how they, they're like you know you'll know he's yours if he tries to kill you yeah well Marengo did try and kill me a bunch of times but he never unseated me once in the end he just I've never been thrown from him and here we were just I don't know I don't know I don't know how to describe these moments I don't just every single second of every single day with my beautiful, beautiful partner, my stupid little dickhead dog, and now beautiful horses was just magic. And we were about to return to reality. We, we, had, to, um, we had to save up, regroup, replan, and decide what we were gonna do next. And on the 780th day, on October 1st, we arrived in Memmingen, Germany, a place that Lou and I had talked about for years. What now? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> we made it! Wow!
I would like to ask your permission to marry your daughter. <laughs> really? Yes. My daughter is very old. How beautiful. She is very young. She is very young. I believe. Ist das jetzt ein Antrag? Laura, sieht das aus wie ein Antrag? Ja. So this is the route we took. Sometimes it was by car, sometimes by bus, uh, but at least 9,000 kilometres of our journey had us in the saddle. And a lot of that was just tearing around Georgia in circles as well. But it's a bit hard to animate that into a map. But this, um, this should give you a pretty good idea of the travel we took. Uh, 780 days, and when you see it mapped out like an Indiana Jones style thing, it, uh, it's pretty impressive. But as soon as we got back, obviously we're getting married, but we began planning the ride for the honeymoon. The honeymoon would see us go from uh, Germany, from Memmingen. We were going to go into France, into Switzerland, back into France. We were going to cross uh, where Hannibal crossed with his elephants 2,000 years ago into Italy, uh, up through uh, Austria, back to uh, Memmingen, and then we'd uh, travel to um, Degendorf, where we live now. We found a wolf store. <laughs> I actually did not really see wolf as part of something I had to consider. I mean, when I was riding through Mongolia and people told me there were wolves, I was kind of like, nah, they're not. <laughs> I thought they were making fun of me. So I didn't know they exist, but since we have been on the road and since I've met Pete and realized that there actually are really big problems with wolf, especially in Mongolia and also in the area where I have been, I see them not such as spiritual animal like they have been shown in the Western world, as you can see here, but as predators. They kill. And they kill people. Like in Mongolia, they, that is like, they fight them, like they lose or they win. So either the wolf gets killed or they get killed. And it's not, it's not like that they, that they shouldn't be there because they're part of the, the whole system but we should not think they are like these harmless beautiful spiritual animals because they kill. Lou and I never had much money but um, we were broke so Lou went to work as a postie riding a bike through the snow the wind and the rain of a German winter. Come springtime though she was fit as a fiddle and she she'd kept her edge it kept her sharp, it kept her wanting more, it kept her aggressive, you know, she, she pushed through so many bad days and uh, I knew the next ride she'd be just as strong as she'd left off. We needed some help though for the next ride we were planning, so we were really happy when Swazi, who'd uh, supplied gear for us the whole way across the steppe, they offered us some free stuff which was pretty awesome. I'd written a couple of books with Lou during the break as well and we got a few books published about our adventures. As for me, I'd worked building this the whole time. We'd learnt so much, we'd made so many mistakes, and with dynamic horses like Marengo, I needed the best gear in the world. So I made it myself and I started selling it. But there was Smokey. Smokey's knee had never been good, and Louisa and I made the, the heartbreaking decision to, um, to retire this spectacular horse to a nice, quiet home.
heard somebody screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. I'm just playing with my, with my dog. <laughs> It's an Australian dog, isn't it? I'm an, I'm an Aussie too. Oh, yeah! Awesome! Yeah, wanna sit down and have a chat? Woof, woof! Oh, little no, no, darling, I'm so sorry. Of course, you can sit on the bench. I was on the floor. <laughs> Yeah, I was just running through Mongolia all by my own and I was so excited! <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? Do you know about all this dangerous shit going around here, dickhead? <laughs> oh, is there really any dangerous things around here? You all seem so peaceful and careless! <laughs> I guess I have to tell you a lot about riding horses in the wild and about surviving. Because believe me or not, I'm really into horses and living in the wild. <laughs> oh, little darling! I've, I've never seen such an attractive and handsome man who loves horses as I do. And he's Australian like you are. You should never let him go again. So our new plan is to win his heart and do crazy adventures together with him. <laughs> We are pretty sure one of the stories is the true story of how they both met. Um, we are really, really happy that you met each other and um, do what you both love. Um, one of those was the fucking true story. <laughs> Which one? I am not telling which one, but it might have been the last one. <laughs> um, or the first one. <laughs> yeah, we wish you all the best. Safe travel, warm feet. Welcome to the family, Pete. <laughs> So we're in the Black Forest. And you've got to have Black Forest cake in the Black Forest. And what I cannot understand about this cake is how it is possible to have this much alcohol in a single piece of cake. It's awesome. Oh my God, there's so much snaps in this cake. There is so much snaps in that cake. It's your kind of cake, Pete. It literally tastes like a shot of Jägermeister. This time around we had the best gear we could find and we thought everything was going to be so smooth. But right from the start, unfortunately, Marengo hopelessly outclassed the horse that had been loaned to Louisa and it was causing some friction between us and her owner. Still, we made the most of summer. We enjoyed every swim, every chance to sleep with the ponies in the sun and just every moment with the dog exploring the Black Forest as we headed west from Germany, heading towards France. Uh, we met amazing people and the Germans, look, they're just awesome. A bit over a week into the trip, we met another long rider. I want to introduce you to Christine. We've just met her yesterday. She, when she came in with her horses, she was trotting over this little rise and then she crossed like a little britchy thing and just trotted in where we're sitting and having a beer and we were just like whoa who's that we've known her from the internet she's on her way from hungary no sorry from the netherlands to hungary and we have the pleasure to meet her so that's this awesome person there hello i'm <laughs> christine oh no pete please not zooming in oh the tattoo the horses, the two horses with me, with my dried out hairy leg. Right from the start, everything Christine did, she made it look good. Now she's a solo rider, but she has two horses. So she has a pack horse, um, Mina, who's as crazy as Marengo, and they kind of had a bit of a lovey thing going on. And Dyker, uh, that's the big black horse she's riding there. Uh, she is one of the most professional, articulate, 
intelligent woman I've ever met, and it was our pleasure to spend the best part of a week with her. Social media is pissing me really off because it's just like it's talking down and it's pointing only out mistakes and it's just looking for yeah for things we do wrong and I think it's so sad because it just stops people from doing things because of all the things that could go wrong or we go wrong and everyone makes fucking mistakes but at least fucking go and do something rather than just find um, like point on other people's mistakes that's it i pissed off on social media <laughs> the way you view the world is totally up to you but for us the way we view the world is we don't want to be better than anyone else we want to be better than our former selves. And we made a big mistake taking a lone horse with us. Uh, we turned down a horse from this amazing Hungarian horsewoman. She is incredible. She's ridden on every continent except Antarctica. And she offered us a horse straight away when she heard that uh, Smokey was no good anymore. Well, I did what I should have done in the first place. We got rid of the English horse and we went and got this uh, beautiful young Hungarian stallion. Now, he is one of the softest, sweetest, most beautiful ponies ever. And uh, yeah, we were going to get him shipped to France, having sent the other horse home. We made mistakes. We made mistakes. We learn from them. We, we grow from it. It's, it's life. You know, we've been making mistakes since the day we set off. And we hoped that finally we would have a horse that could match the mighty Marengo. Um, but yeah, I wasn't happy. You know, I mean, it was supposed to be our honeymoon and Lou was doing a great job of salvaging as well, as much fun as she could. Um, but I was, I was a bit grumpier still, you know, hey, I, I still am a, a drunk with PTSD. But my beautiful wife um, made us eat frog legs and <laughs> we're eating snails and stuff and she was really positive, really positive. But we'd had, you know, a lot of, a lot of low points in that, that first part of our, our, our trip. But... <laughs> Lou got it organised. She got the horse on the way, and then it went via Holland. It was lost for 60 hours. Lou turned into Liam Neeson. Then the driver stole a little dog from the place where we were staying, and Lou just pulled it all together. When Lou's new horse, who we named Banditi, arrived, he wasn't looking good. But he ate straight away, and he, he powered back to condition, and he just, he was best mates with Marengo from the start. He's curious, sweet, soft and in about a week he was to a standard that was so far beyond the lone horse that we just we were reinvigorated may i hug you too of course you can <laughs> the jilly dog gang was back by total accident I caught Lou with some pretty profound reflections on the mistakes made with the lone horse. Now he will continue his journey in comfort. And I was reading the sentence and I was like, that is such a human thing to say. To say like, yes, so he will always stay in his comfort zone. He will never be pushed. He will never be better than average because he will never try. He will never live. He will never have the passion because he just stays in there. And that's fine and it's good. But he will never be like amazing because you can't if you stay in what feels good and comfortable and lazy and safe how can you do amazing things like outrageous things you can't it is a partnership like we need to like there's a horse that needs to have a part and we need to have a part and we both need to be respected and find a way to work together it's not all about me but it's also not all about the horse We've never stopped challenging what we think we know. We've never stopped falling in love. We've never stopped trying. And we've never stopped just lusting for adventure. Well, Banditi proved to be a superb horse. More, more for his, how do I put it? His, his softness, his sweetness, his willingness to work with us, his longing to be part of something. And that something he was now becoming a part of was the Jilly Dog Gang. Banditi was the missing piece that we've been looking for for so long. And with both horses with EU passports, we were free to travel wherever we wanted. We'd gone from Germany to France. We'd crossed Switzerland, gone back to France, and we'd crossed the Alps. 
uh, straight into straight into Italy. Uh, our plan was to um, to head towards uh, uh, first Austria and then Germany. We had a long way to go, and along the way, we had a really important milestone to tick over. Louisa and I had almost ridden 10,000 kilometers together. It was um, was huge. Uh, we'd been on the road together for around about 850 days. Uh, we'd seen incredible things, gone through so many hardships. Snowstorms, negative 20, wind, rain, you know, 35 degree days. Um, so we've swum across swollen rivers. We've, you know, slept under the stars. We've, we've eaten all kinds of strange food. We've hunted, we've fished, and, and we've grown so much as human beings. And, really importantly, as a couple. Um, my wife and I love each other. We, we never would have met at a bar. We never would have swiped left or right or whichever way it is you swipe on Tinder if we'd seen each other. The only way we could have become the Jilly Dog Gang is through that chance meeting in Mongolia. And there's not one minute of any day since that I have regretted walking over and asking that beautiful little German girl if I could pat her dog. That's, that's how the adventure started. It's an adventure I'm so proud of. I'm proud to say I love my wife. I really wish I had something profound to say here, but I just don't really have the words. It was a hell of an achievement, and it would have been a lot better if I didn't have music we don't have the license to use playing in the background. So sadly, I've got to voice this one over. But the Italian Alps, by a lake, 10,000 kilometers with the woman I love. So how do you celebrate? Well. I mean, I like to have a few glasses of champagne, but Louisa, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, my wife's kind of a little bit crazy and uh, she's well and truly known for her outrageous dancing, her terrible karaoke and her passion to express herself around uh, music. God, she's cute. <laughs> she's, she's one in a billion, this one. One in, one in seven billion, actually. You get used to having your piss outside. <laughs> but when it gets really gross and you have to shit in the bag, that, that, that's, that's something I don't think I'll get used to. This, the other day, when I was crawling out of the sleeping bag having a piss at night, it's very nice because you only have to go two meters from your actual bed. <laughs> I had my sleeping socks on and I was talking to Pete and then I pissed my socks. And at this point, I started laughing and told Pete how hilarious it was that I pissed on my sock. And I realized then that I was absolutely back to enjoying the ride and had totally overcome the drama that we had before because you can take it two ways. Either you laugh about it or you stress about it that you now have a sock with piss on that you need to find now a place to wash when the weather is cold and it probably will take three days to dry. I'm glad I laughed. In the West we're told, get the vaccine, study hard, get a good job so you can buy a good house, a car, all of that kind of stuff, buy it on a nice street and be like, just like everyone else. You know, when you own these things, you don't really own them. They own you. They will always own you. You don't own your house, the bank owns it and your mortgage to it. You're always told to stay in your lane, you know, not to rock the boat. Uh, and if you're German, you're always told to follow the rules. And what does that get you? You know, it gets you a big screen TV full of fake news and Kardashians, uh, swipes on Tinder, and the madness of the woke agenda, you know, giving seven-year-olds the you know, option of a sex change. I think it's crazy. The, the, the world has lost its mind. And I look at life like a set of scales. Most of us, we only ever stand on one side, looking up at everything we don't have. But Lou and I stood on the other side for a while. And having done so, it's put us in a position where we've struggled ever since to find the balance. And it's certainly alienated us from our peers in the West but we risked it to get the biscuit. And we are closer to finding balance than most. And we found, you know, through this, you know, I guess the secret to a, a successful marriage. 
And for us, that's to fall in love with the same person every single day. That and to let go of the bullshit. And sometimes letting go of the bullshit means having nothing. As Bliss and Esso say, fuck the cars, money and accessories. The only thing we really own is our memories. Look, that's a great line from a great song, and it's true. It's absolutely true. The only thing we do take to our death is our memories, and you will die. I will die. But I'm going to take a lot of happy memories with me. So make life beautiful. Send out the love, and it'll come back. Believe in magic, but understand it only shares itself with you if you seek it. So seek it. Believe in yourself. Be the star of your own movie. And if you're not good enough, work harder. Work hard until you are good enough. And when you fuck up, forgive yourself for it. Forgive those that have wronged you. Hug your loved ones. Tell them. Tell them every chance you have that you love them. Never be afraid to say I'm sorry. Never. And look yourself in the mirror and be happy with who you are. And if you aren't happy with the person looking back at you, change. You have the power. Everyone has the power. You are the master of your own destiny. And for me, someone that's battled with anxiety, PTSD, and all kinds of problems that he created for himself, it took meeting just this beautiful free spirit who was in love with life, her dog, and the idea that the world still held magic. For me to realize, I could change. I'm the best version of myself because of horses, because of Louisa, and because of Jill. I'm happy. I'm really happy. I hope you enjoyed our story, and I can assure you that the Jilly Dog Gang is only just getting started. When people come and ask me what I'm gonna do with my life, I just say, Alice Kutu. I'm living that champagne lifestyle. Cheers. So we are 50 kilometers from home. I just called a friend asking if she could pick us up tonight. I'm ready for the break and I have been for a while, but it's it's to know when to quit and today was the day to quit but Lidi has been slipping all over the road he is tired and Peter and me have started arguing about dumb stuff and it's it's better to stop here so we all can <laughs> the donkey agrees <laughs> so yeah that's it end of this ride. For a while now I've been um, trying to think how to end this. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's, I've got nothing written down. I've got no notes. I'm just, you know, in bed with a blanket over my head, thinking about all the amazing, amazing times I shared with my wife. Um, she saved my life three times. I'm 100% I'm convinced. Uh, I would have, I would have died somewhere on the step if it wasn't for her. I found something in myself. I found something in the world by opening myself up to this, this incredible experience with this incredible woman. I believe in love. I believe in magic. And I believe that anyone that truly commits to finding it they will. They will. I did.
I don't like. Whoa! Steady, boy. Okay, so that was my horse getting scared of one of his own farts while on a vertical <laughs> And I, I got the whole thing on camera. That is brilliant. That is brilliant. That's Lou getting mad at me for filming this. That's, that's probably the best thing I'll film all year. Oh my God. <laughs>